Uh, the third and the most efficient is more like um, a bandsaw mill, like, uh, which can cut a lot quicker, a lot bigger, a lot better volume. But again, it's a greater expense. Um, you have to have equipment to get the log to the bandsaw mill, so it's all about trade-offs. Um, and that's kind of how this breaks down. So what you need to do first off is you need your material in a, in a way cribbed up here like, like we've got it so you can work at it on a comfortable height. The first thing you need to do is you need something on top of the log that's going to be flat. As a guide, I typically use a ladder. You can use an old wooden ladder. You can use a, an extension ladder that you take apart. It's simply you need something that the, for the chainsaw guide to run across and make that first flat cut. Once we flip that cant off, then we can use the saw, lo, the saw or the log itself as a guide here that you'll see. So there's many ways you can do that. You don't have to use a ladder. In the early days when I first started doing it, I had some great big spikes, some nails, um, that I would run a string line and I would just set a 2 by 12 on the top of it. So you can do that too. The problem with that is the vibration kind of wants to jiggle it off. So I found the ladder to be a pretty good way to go. I just drill a couple uh, holes here in the, in the rungs and I've got a level and we'll just put a couple of screws in there. It, it, it pretty much holds itself. I, I'll go along here and, and kind of look at it and if the ladder is teeter-tottering, I'll take my hatchet and I'll just knock down a couple of the high spots so it's, it's sitting pretty flat. I can actually mill with the ladder sitting as it is. I'll just put a couple screws in just for, just for insurance to, to uh, keep it off, or just to keep it off the log. So our first cut, we've got to determine how high to set the blade. And the logs have tapers in them. The more tapers you have, uh, the, the deeper you have to go on the other side. So when you're figuring board foot, when you're figuring footage, you always want to start on the smaller end. That's what the logging, that's what the mills will pay you for. So if you have a tree that has a lot of taper in it, what they'll do is, it's called scaling, they'll take the small end and they'll essentially run a cylinder through that. Everything outside of that you don't get paid for. So when you're figuring lumber and when you're figuring and measuring everything, we're going to come here down here to the small end. For timber framing, usually you don't use anything smaller than a 6x6. Six six. It's a full dimension 6x6. Six six. The material you buy now, a 2x4 is not actually a 2x4, it's actually one and a half. It's a half inch smaller. But everything we cut or timber framing is full dimension, so a 6x6 six six is truly a 6x6, six six, and that would be the smallest material we'd go. So how we set the elevation of our first cut is we just want to come along here and just make sure on the small end that when we're, when we're from flat point to flat point, we've got at least 6 inches. And it's good to have a couple extra because that log, you know, they'll do this and they'll change and, and you'll have to end up recutting it. So I'll, I'll try to figure about two inches bit bigger than what I want and then we'll make that first cut. So another thing to consider is it's, it's kind of physically demanding to push the saw. You want your blades to be really sharp. So on a log like this, if it doesn't have a lot of dirt in the bark, you can figure I could probably get about four passes between sharpening. If it's a bigger log, the stuff that I cut at home is usually about 32 inches. You can get about two passes. So what I do is I have about four chains. I sharpen them in the shop, in the shop and I bring them out to the field and, and just do it that way. So I guess we'll just hook this down and then we'll just jump right in and start cutting. Another thing is I like how he's got it here at an angle. You can have, let gravity be your friend a little bit. If I was cutting, I would definitely want to cut down the hill and not push the saw up the hill. It just makes it easier. and have to kind of think how to work smarter and not harder and this is a perfect example of that. So I'm going to use some power tools like a cordless drill and, and such but you could of course do it without any of that. This just helps speed things along a little bit. You do have to think about knots. You do have to think about knots. Not so much in the milling but when you're laying out the material to use. If we have time we might be able to do a little bit of timber framing and some joinery and, and so when I'm taking a beam and I'm laying things out, I'm measuring where my joints are going to be because I don't want to chisel in a knot because some of these knots can be hard as glass and they're very difficult to work with and they're not, there's not a lot of strength in them. When you look at a board and you see knots in it, just envision those knots as holes in the board or holes in the timber because they have no strength whatsoever and eventually they'll dry and actually fall out. So if you were going to use something for a rafter, 
and it's got half of it or two thirds of it is not, that's not one you're going to want to use for anything load bearing. Use that somewhere else where it's not going to show. Just like painting a car, a paint job is only as good as what's underneath of it. It's only as good as the bodywork. So how you do your setup and how you do your first cut is going to determine how everything else comes out. So if you've got a big log, I've got some big ones I'm working on at my place, and if, if that ladder has got a sag in it, everything you cut is going to have a sag in it. So you, it's really worth taking a little bit of time and setting up and making sure that you're good on the first cut. And then after that, it's all, it's all pretty simple. And again, these are really just depending to hold it in place. Forward. A lot of guys build them and they just use uh, aluminum. I would recommend that because the steel ones are awfully heavy. And when you have that, all that weight out with your arms out, it's pretty hard on your back. So that's what's nice about the aluminum ones. And I've got several uh, friends that have looked for these on Craigslist because a lot of guys will buy them and do one project and then they'll resell them. And you can usually get them um, for half or less of what you'd be new. For this mill right here, it should be just under $200. And you can get them small, or you can get them great big, up to six feet or so. Mm -hmm. And the only difference is the length of these risers here. So you kind of have to average what your, what your biggest log is going to be, and then size it, therefore. And also, you're going to need to have a big saw. Uh, a 66, still 66, 88s are, are preferable. This is a 441. It's a little bit light. It's just what I have. So my next saw will be a, a little bit bigger. Yeah. yeah, aren't you glad you know that right now? Oh. Uh, I've already got it picked <laughs> out. <laughs> the chain is a little different on a ripping saw as well. You can use a standard skip chain, full skip chain, regular logging chain, cross cut chains. They cut just fine. They leave a pretty rough surface. Uh, this is a ripping chain. Uh, instead of being filed at 30 degree angle, it's filed at a 5 degree angle. And the tooth configuration is a little bit different. And so it, it doesn't cut any faster, but it does leave a lot smoother, smoother finish. You can make your own rip chains or you can uh, buy them as well. Yeah. Does it usually help to extend the ladder just slightly past the butt of the tree? Yeah. Yeah, you want it to extend a little bit. Uh, usually I'm going to have a good foot to a foot and a half of trim on the logs that I cut. So if I get a little bit crooked until I get the guide on the ladder, it's, it's not super critical. So I'm going to kind of look at these and see where my blade is at this setting. And then we'll make the adjustment and then we can start cutting. But you can see right here, it's pretty good about where it is. I've got a good uh, 10 inches right there. I've got some wane or some uh, checking in there. So I'm just going to leave it alone. I think that that's probably pretty good. I might raise it about one inch. Wouldn't hurt a bit. So on the mill are graduated numbers here on these two posts. So you can simply loosen this. And all the hardware on the mill uh, is the same size as your as your chainsaw tool wrench. So you usually have that in your pocket so you can make your adjustments. So I'll go down here and adjust for a five inch cut. And I'm 
match this so it's exactly the same. You can even cut angles with this uh, if you wanted to cut angles for siding, for example. You can cut cedar or fir mm. siding. Mm. You could set this at five and six and get just a little bit of that angle so when your laps come together, it's not starting to stack out on you. So it's pretty versatile. What are the more expensive mills have that this one doesn't have? Well, to get a more expensive mill, you're getting into a, a bandsaw mill. And you can build your own like Brandon did. Um, but retail turnkey sawmills like wood misers, their entry level are going to be pretty close to six grand. And it doesn't stop there because you go through a lot of bandsaw blades, and those most people don't have the ability to sharpen those, so you have to send those in. <laughs> are you able to sharpen your own bandsaw? Though? That's for doing. I don't have a bandsaw uh, uh, sawmill, so I know Woodmiser sells all of the tools, everything, the grinder to sharpen them. It's about two thousand dollars to do that. But I haven't looked into it if there's cheaper ways because I I just haven't had a mill to to use. So this is going to be pretty noisy. Obviously, I have some earplugs. I don't know if I have enough for everyone. I'll let you guys fight for them.